Amen. Well, good morning. And good morning to those of you watching online. Thank you, worship team, for that. Uh, it was awesome to, to hear, uh, to sing Psalm 8 and to hear it read like that. Thank you, Emma. And uh, just, just a very creative way to introduce us to this, this text. And uh, to get us thinking about sort of the main point of this text, I first want to, to confess to you that I, I realize that probably about 95% of my sermon illustrations are about sports and movies. And for some of you, that might be a good thing. For others of you, you might be lost. And so I'm, I want to try to diversify a little bit today. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about math, um, which I admit is not my best subject. So you know that, how there's like an order of operations when you do equations, right? There's this, uh, I think they call it PEMDAS is the, the acronym. It's you know, you do parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, and subtract. I had to look that up because I only ever got to my dear Aunt Sally, you know, <laughs> multiply, divide, just as a subtraction. Like my, my high school calculus teacher was like, you don't belong here. <laughs> so, and I thank him for that every day. But what's the point? The point is, is that if you don't follow this order of operations, if you try to do algebra and you don't multiply or divide or whatever the right thing first, you end up with disordered math. You end up with the wrong answer on the test. And, and that has to do with Psalm 8 in a very weird way. I get it. But what's going on here is that David is, is talking about an order, not of, not of operations in math, but an order of operations in creation. That there's an order to how God has made the universe, and there's an order to how we ought to prioritize different created things, and there's an order to that, that it all falls under prioritizing God as creator. And so we're going to talk about that today, and we're going to see how, you know, when we, when we delight in worshiping God as creator, um, we are we're doing worship the right way. When we don't, when we fail to recognize him as creator, and we, we look at created things uh, in a different way than we should, we end up with disorder. We end up with dysfunction. Our worship is off. We're worshiping the wrong things. So the first thing we're going to see this morning as we look at Psalm 8 is that creation clearly reveals that God is to be glorified above all else. I mean, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, and we'll leave it there. That's kind of a cliffhanger, but we'll get to it. So David, most people think, is probably out you know, on, on the palace rooftops looking up at the night sky, the stars, probably because you know, he mentions the stars, the moon, the heavens, but he doesn't say anything about the sun. So he's looking up at the night sky, and he's thinking about the creation account. He's thinking about Genesis 1, and this is his, his poetic response to God creating the heavens and the earth. This, he's, he's breaking out into song because he's thinking about how God made everything. So if, I wonder if you've ever done that. Have you ever gone out and looked up at the night sky? Like, not in Tampa, because of light pollution, but like if you've gone out into the country, you've gone camping and looked at the night sky and just, just watched you know, as the stars explode above you and, just, and, you, and you cannot fathom it and you're just in awe of it. Or maybe you do that when you see the ocean. You see a sunrise or a sunset over the ocean. Um, when we were in Taiwan, we got to go to the Taipei Zoo and I got to see a giant panda not asleep. He was actually moving around and doing stuff and like climbing up the little bamboo tree and it was awesome. I mean like, all of that stuff, um, a, a friend I, I talked to just past, this past Sunday was at Yellowstone, and uh, he came back and he's like, how can you look at Yellowstone and not believe in God? And exa exactly, that's exactly right. We are meant to look at the creation, and it's meant to direct our hearts and our thoughts to the creator, to the designer of it. Of course, we, we can't know about him unless we go and read the Bible then, but that's, that's the whole point. Then we look at the Bible and we learn about God and we worship him. That's how we're designed. So we're designed to say, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth? But why his name? Why don't we just say, oh, Lord, how majestic are you in all the earth? I mean, what's the difference? 
This is important. So to say that God's name is majestic is essentially to talk about how what is known about him is majestic. In other words, God, we, we know some things about you. you we, you've revealed yourself to us in your word. But we also know, and David knew, it wasn't everything about God, right? The, inf- the, the knowledge of God is infinite. Like, you can learn something new about God every day for eternity and never stop. Because we know in his word that what is revealed to us in the Bible, some theologians will call baby talk. God is speaking baby talk to us. And you're like, whoa, I don't understand the Bible. Like, that's crazy to think that's baby talk, but it is. God is revealing to us about himself in a most basic way everything that we need to know, but it's not everything there is to know about God. So what David is saying is, I look up, I know that you're the creator, and I know some things about you, but I also know that I'm just scratching the surface. I also know there's so much more, and I can't ever know it all. And so again, he breaks out into worship. That leads him to worship because he, can't, he thinks, wow, how, how infinite are you? How powerful are you? I can't even know you fully. But we do know that he created everything. We do know he put it all into place. That's what Genesis 1-1 says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that alone should lead us to worship. David talks about how, you know, God created everything just with his fingers, I mean, why does the author use that language? You made this with your fingers. It's almost like he's saying, God, this was just easy for you. It was easy for you to make the universe. I mean, I think about things that I can do with my fingers, right? Like I can snap to a tune off beat. I can uh, flick a paper football, you know? I can uh, jazz hands, right? What can God do with his fingers? Well, he can create two billion trillion planets and suns and galaxies and stuff like come on like this is crazy to think just how magnificent our creator god is so he says david says god you have set your glory above the heavens now let's talk about that what what is glory did you ever stop and think just how would you define glory the hebrews they defined it as like power Oh, so, so you could say, God, your power is above the heavens. Or, or they would also talk about it as like weight. You know, so, so you're weightier than the heavens. God, you're, you, are, you carry more weight in this universe than anything else. It's what he, kind of what he's saying. Um, and in heavens, the Jews, uh, and David included, actually thought there were three heavens. So they thought of it as being like the sky, the, the atmosphere, that's one, and then the space where the planets are, that's two, and then the heaven where, where God dwells, like where the heavenly beings are, where the angels are, that's the third heaven, and he's saying, you're even above all that. And by the way, David did not even know what he was saying, right? Because he didn't know anything about space other than what he could see. Like, what do we know about space now? We know that we're just part of a little solar system. I mean, Pluto, the, the farthest planet, which I guess it is a planet again, right? I think is 3.1 billion miles away from Earth. Someone calculated it. They said that if you were going 65 miles an hour, it would take you over 6,200 years to get to Pluto. That's a long trip. I wouldn't take my five-year-olds on that trip. And, and then that's just our solar system. There's actually 100, either billion or a million, I don't know, a lot of solar systems just in our little galaxy, the Milky Way. And then... There's this one astronomer I looked up who says that we think there's probably like 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Can you imagine that? Like, that's unfathomable to think that there are that many different galaxies in this massive universe. And David's saying, God, your glory can't be contained in it. Your glory cannot be contained even in that massive space. Not only that, but, but you just you made it all just by speaking How majestic is your name above all the earth, above all the heavens? So when we think about that, we then think about an ordering of creation, and we realize there is no question, God, God is first. God deserves all glory, all honor, all praise. Switchfoot, this this band, uh, maybe maybe you've heard of them, they they had a song called Stars, and they just say, when I look at the stars, I see someone else. Exactly, you see 
the evidence that someone must have made this, and then you go and you look at the word and you read, yes, it was God. He made it. And we praise him. We look up in awe of the creator. The question for you this morning and for myself is, can we do that? Can we look up in awe? Can we look up with, with wonder and, and, and just appreciate the mystery of it all? Um, this is kind of the point of verse 2, which is a little weird. It seems kind of out of place. He says, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. There's a lot we could say about this, but the, the basic gist of it is just that sometimes kids are smarter than us. Sometimes, you know, a kid will just, it's, it's like the simplest answer is the right answer, right? A kid looks up at the night sky and thinks, oh, wow, God must have made that. He's awesome. It's the right answer. It's exactly, that's, that's the meaning of life right there. And yet, we adults, we look up and we think of any and every reason or every explanation but that. We look up and we, we think, that's random. It all just kind of happened, like some gases exploded. Or some, like literally some people think aliens did it. They, they, I don't know where they came from, but they, they made all that. Or, or let's just get past that and just think about more of our motivations. Like, do you want to praise God when you see that? Or would you rather... Like sometimes I look up and I'm like, I don't want to praise you. I want to be the center. I want to be the point. I want to be the one that gets the glory, not you. Sorry, I'm, I'm messing with this thing real quick here. Or maybe, maybe we don't have room for wonder in our lives. Like maybe we are too busy. Maybe we are... We're so busy that we just want everything in our life to be kind of like controlled and predictable, and we can't even take the time to look up and wonder at the glory of creation. We can't even, we just don't have room for mystery in our lives right now. That could, that could be a thing. Or maybe we don't want to look up and attribute glory to God because we are bitter at God. We think, God, if you are so awesome and if you made such beautiful creation, then why is my life so messy and ugly? We're bitter at him, so we don't want to ascribe glory to him. And all of this is, is pride. And, and sometimes the, ch- the children who don't seem to really have those same kinds of effects in their lives yet, they're the ones who are giving the best answers as to why we should glorify God. And we need to learn from them. That's why Jesus talks so much about childlike faith. But either way, what we see here is obvious. The, the creation has a creator, and we are designed to glorify him and to worship him because his glory cannot be contained in the universe. And then the second thing we see is that being in awe of God's majesty and his magnificence as seen in creation uh, keeps our views of created things in their proper place. So let's talk about that. You know, as beautiful as the natural world is, as amazing as, as, the, as the created things are, that we see when we look up at the sky or out at the ocean, those things are not as amazing as us, as human beings. We are the greatest things that God ever made. And he tells us that. So Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So there's only one creation that has the distinction of being created in God's image, and that's us. We are made as a reflection of him. That, That means that we're like him, but not exactly like him. So, I mean, obviously there's tons of things that God is that we aren't. I mean, he's creator, we are creations. He is infinite, and we are finite. He's omnipresent, and we are clearly not. Have you ever, you ever tried to be in two places at once? doesn't work very well. Um, but he is everywhere all the time. He's all-knowing, and we are not. And, and if you ever try to be all-knowing, that, that will give you a headache. But so clearly we are different, but we reflect him. You know, in, in other ways, like the, the ability for us to love and to, and to think and reason and communicate just things that animals are not able to do. We reflect God in that way. 
and we're meant to glorify him with our lives. So clearly, if, if we're talking about an order of creation, the priority of how things are made, God is first, I and mean, we've already talked about that. He transcends everything, but then we are second. We are right below him, essentially. We are the most important thing he's ever made, the pinnacle of his creation. David says this in verse 5. He talks about how we're crowned with glory and honor. In other words, we're, we're like God's royal ambassadors. We're his representatives on earth. And in verse 6, he says that we have dominion over the creation. We have the right and the responsibility to be stewards of everything that God has made. So, so there's that priority. God is over all. Humans are his greatest creations. And then the rest of creation is under us, under our authority. We see that in Genesis 2. God tells Adam, go name the animals. Okay? So to name something is to have authority over it. Noah in the ark, right? God says, Noah, I'm going to flood the earth, but I want you to put pairs of every animal on the ark so we can rescue them, save them. And Jesus himself says it. He says in Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Jesus says it very plainly. People, you are more valuable than animals. So what are some implications of this, of, of, a, of a, a right way of looking at the order of creation? Well, again, you know, we've already talked about the worship of God first, but, but for humans, the way we look at ourselves and look at our, our neighbors and everybody else we have to understand that we have a higher value than any other creation. We have more dignity than any other creation. We simply have more dignity than the animals. I don't believe that we're just like one step away from being monkeys. There is something that clearly separates us in terms of dignity and value. And then that gives us the right then to have authority over the rest of creation. So just some practical things to think about. We have every right to have pets. We have every right to keep animals at a zoo. You know, um, something that's probably hits a little closer to home with Floridians is like, let's say you live near a pond, you have every right to call that alligator dude to come get a nuisance alligator out of your pond. Like, I, I read some people on messages boards being frustrated by that, saying like, well, they were here first. Like, well, if he's 12 feet and he's going to eat your pets, get him out. You have the right to do that. God says that is you properly subduing the creation. Because in, in some ways you're protecting other parts of creation and even protecting maybe your children. That type of thing is within reason for us. And maybe, maybe this for some of you will be a little more touchy, but we have the right to raise animals for food. We have the right to put animals on a farm and say these animals are literally just here for us to eat them. There's a, about 15 years ago or so, a lady came to my door, and when I opened it, the first thing she asked me was, are you a Christian? I was like, I started thinking, like, what cult are you from? But <laughs> I said, yes, I'm a Christian. And she said, okay, well, do you eat meat? And then I was like, where is this going? I was so confused, but I said, okay, yeah, sure, I eat meat. And she said, well, I thought you were a Christian. I was like, I am. I just told you that. Well, well, haven't you heard of the commandment, you shall not murder? And I'm like, what? Yeah, if you, if you kill animals, you're murdering them. I'm like, no, 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 no. Look, God is saying you shall not murder other people. Like, that's, animals don't apply. <laughs> I mean, think about this for a second. We have no right to kill another human being unless it's in a, 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 just a case of desperation where we are, we're literally, that's the only option. We're trying to defend ourselves or our family and, and like we just have to, or it's like a just war situation, but otherwise we have no right to do that. But we have every right to kill animals, to eat them. I mean, God even says in the book of Acts, when he comes to Peter in that vision, he says, he shows him all these animals and he says, kill and eat. And maybe that's hard to hear, but, but God has given us dominion over the creation, over these animals. God if you like to hunt, you like to fish, go hunt and go fish. Go get yourself something tasty. I was uh, introduced to a country song this week 
by uh, my favorite fish and wildlife officer, who uh, this is a country song called Hunting, Fishing, and Loving Every Day. I'm like, that's a Genesis 1 song. That's a Psalm 8 song. That guy, he's, he's proclaiming the word. Now, I don't want to be insensitive, but that, that is, it is within our rights to eat meat. Now, if you're vegan, if you're vegetarian, don't stop being vegan or vegetarian. You have every right to do that, too. That is, that is perfectly fine. I, I would not want anyone to, to go against their conscience. If you feel like you can't do that, you do, do, you, do you in that area, right? But... What I am saying is that it is not morally wrong for us to eat meat simply because God has said, you can. He says, I've given this to you for food. What other implications do we see from this? Well, thinking not just not of animals, but the environment, we have the right as human beings to, to, to uh, shape and mold our environment to suit our needs, right? So like, think about where we are right now. We had to uh, I'm assuming coming in bulldoze a bunch of, of trees so that we could build our church. Okay, is that wrong? Is that, no, God, God would say that's not wrong. We have that right. We can subdue the land. We can bring uh, order out of chaos to suit our purposes. What, what have we done here? We've built a building where we can now come and worship the Lord. And we, we mitigated it with some swamp land, right? There's lots of swamp land back there. I wouldn't recommend going in, in walking around back there, but it's there, I promise. So, so we, I think, you know, we built this to suit our needs, but we also properly care for the environment um, in, a, in a, I think, a God-honoring way. Um, we have the right to, you know, like, if you want to dam up a river to create hydroelectric power, or if you want to go drill for oil in the Gulf of Mexico, I, I believe God is saying that is you properly exercising dominion over the creation. Now, does that mean that we can just abuse the creation? Does that mean that we can, do we have the right to just abuse animals? You know, you think about like Michael Vick got arrested for dog fighting and all that. I mean, absolutely not. We are called to steward the creation, which means to care for it in a way that is honoring to the Lord. We're not called to abuse it. We're not called to pollute the environment. Polluting the environment is, is opposite of what God would have us do because God is saying, I want you to follow my creative lead. I want you to bring order out of chaos. And when we pollute the environment, we're actually bringing chaos where there was once order. So that is certainly not okay for us. But we are stewards. We, are, we have the responsibility of caring for creation. And uh, when we, we don't see it that way, when we, when we mix up our creation order priorities, we end up worshiping the creation instead. I want to give you an example of that, where humans become subservient to the creation. So, so environmentalism for some people is just, well, here's how we can take better care of the environment, which is one thing. But then environmentalism for other people is almost like a religion. And, and you would see like, you probably even heard people talk about this where there are people who, who really truly live under this, this fear that we are going to destroy the planet. And it's like, we got like 10 years left and it's done unless we take some extremely drastic measures. And I think people legitimately live in fear of that to the point where I, I found this article this week from The Guardian, it's a newspaper, um, I believe out of London, and in 2018, this lady named Amy Fleming wrote an article entitled, Would You Give Up Having Children to Save the Planet? Question mark. Meet the couples who have. So this article is about these people who have decided that, that for them to have children would be morally wrong because these children are toxic for the environment. They have... I guess they have, they have, their carbon footprint is, is too big. And so they have gotten sterilized, so they cannot have children, and therefore they will save the planet. And I am here to tell you that that is a sad disordering of the creation order. Because what they've essentially done is they've said, I'm going to sacrifice my ability to have more image bearers so that I can protect something that's not made in God's image. We've completely flipped the ordering of how God's created things. 
Instead of stewarding the creation, they're worshiping the creation. And I'm not saying that you know, it's, it's wrong to not have kids. I, I mean, there might be other reasons why you need to not have kids or, or can't or whatever. But what I am saying is that if it's because we are worshiping the creation, then we're going about it with all of the wrong motives. It's a, it's a disordered worship. And that's, you know, if you think about the, the, the root causes of that, you just look back to Adam in the garden. When Adam and Eve were approached by a snake... In Genesis 3, a snake is a created thing, subservient to human beings, right? What should Adam have done as, as this snake comes up and starts telling Eve these lies about God? If Adam is properly exercising his dominion over the creation, what should he have done? He should have crushed the head of the snake or at least told it to get lost. But instead, he sat there and he let it lie to his wife, and as a result, sin entered the world, and we've been cursed, and creation's been broken ever since. All because Adam failed to properly exercise dominion over the creation. And we see, we see this brokenness probably most clearly in the way we treat each other. Because if we fail, if we fail to look at the creation and see God and, and, and worship him, and we're of the mind that he's just not, there is no God or whatever, then we end up with this, we, we, we think we have the responsibility then to create our own value systems for other people, right? I mean, we decide who's valuable and who's not. I mean, God clearly in the scriptures has said all human life is valuable because you're all made in God's image, but if we don't believe in God, we're saying, well, some human life is more valuable than others. So, all you have to do to look at the extreme results of this is to look at any genocide in history. You go look at the African slave trade, where we basically, some human beings created in God's image said, these people who are created in God's image are actually not people. So we can buy them and sell them and kill them and, and do whatever we want with them. And, and we caused hundreds of years of just destruction and, and complete disregard for human life. And... The Holocaust, I mean, maybe the most obvious example of this, or, or the, um, the massacres in Rwanda in the 1990s. This is all because some people said, well, I'm in the place of God, and I'm going to make a value judgment about who's valuable and who's not. And those are very extreme examples. But we also do this just individually every single day, even when we think about our own value. So, like, pretty much every time I go to the beach... My kids are like burying themselves in the sand and stuff, but then I look around and I see almost always there'll be like some girl with her boyfriend taking pictures of her, okay? And they'll be doing it for like two hours. And then um, I don't know what they're going to do with those pictures, but I can guess that maybe she's going to go home and she's going to agonize over which one is the most perfect one to put on her Instagram account so that she can get likes, so that she can what? feel valuable. Is that where you get your value? Other people looking at your pictures and saying, yeah, you're valuable. Or no, not really. Do you get your value just based on, like, like some people I think believe that you're only as valuable as your contribution to society. So like, if you are hardworking and you, you know, do all kinds of wonderful things to contribute to your community or the world, you're valuable. But these lazy people over here, they are not valuable. No, that's not the way God sees people. Or maybe you feel like, um, you know, just, I have more stuff than my neighbors, so I'm more valuable than, I, I don't know. There's all kinds of crazy ways that we try to come up with these value systems for ourselves, for our self-worth, when all we really need to do is just look at what the Creator says about us. You are made in God's image. It doesn't matter if you're male, female, it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter you know, what you do for a living, it doesn't matter how old or young you are, it doesn't matter how smart or foolish you are, it doesn't matter if you're good looking or not good looking, it doesn't matter if you're disabled, you are made in God's image, you are valuable above every other creation he's ever made. Period. It starts there. And when we miss that, we, we get off into so much disorder, so much chaos in our lives. We are lost at sea with no compass. 
And it's been that way ever since Adam. It's been that way ever since he failed to exercise dominion over the snake. We've, all, we've always fallen short. So that's why it's good news as we close that Jesus is the redeemer of all creation. That to the glory of God the Father and for the majesty of his name, he has, he has come and succeeded in every way that we have failed. You know, there's a debate about what is Psalm 8 actually about? Is it about David talking about the creation or is it about Jesus? And really the answer is both. It's both. It's David saying, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth because of everything you've made. But it's also David saying, and, and somehow in my mind I know you're going to send the Redeemer. And here, here's what he's going to do. He's going to be made a little lower than the angels for a time so that he can come and properly redeem creation and set everything under his feet. And that's what Jesus did. The author of Hebrews actually quotes some of Psalm 8 in, in chapter 2 of Hebrews. And in Hebrews 2.9 it says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So like our idolatry, our failure to worship God the Father, our disorder, our sin are such massive problems that the Son of Man had to come and taste death for every one of us. He had to do that, to, to suffer and to die on the cross so that he could restore us and so that he could restore our universe. And again, I want you to see like he had to do everything perfectly where we fail. Everything that we failed to do, he has done rightly and perfectly, and he had to become a human to do it. He had to be made into, he had to, be, he had to come and be incarnate in a human body, a real, he had to become a real man to show us what it means to be a real man, to show us how to, you know, to come and properly obey and glorify his father. And he did it all perfectly so that he could be a perfect sacrifice for us on the cross. He, he can go on the cross and die and take our place and, and, and give up his life for us. And it's an acceptable sacrifice for every human being who the father has ever chosen for him. But not only that, then he rises from the dead, right? He rose from the dead. And what do we know? We, we know that he has dealt a mortal death blow to Satan. He properly exercises dominion over the creation by crushing the head of the serpent. It's the best news we've ever heard. He did what Adam failed to do. That's why he's the second Adam. So without Jesus, without the second Adam, the God-man, sacrificing himself on, our, on the cross in our place. We have no hope. We'll never be able to look up at the sky and praise God the Father. We'll never be able to treat our neighbors or ourselves with any kind of respect or dignity. And, catch this, without Jesus, not only are we lost, creation's lost. Jesus is the only hope for all of creation. Like, some people think that the Bible's saying that you know, God is going to save a few people, get them out of here, and then just destroy everything. But that's not what the Bible says. I don't even know where people get that. The Bible is saying, no, look, look at Romans 8, 19. Look at this. The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. You see, sometimes I think our pets are looking at us, and if they could talk, they're saying, what did you do? Why did you mess everything up? Like, I mean, for, for us especially, because I have a three-legged cat. And I think our three-legged cat is like, not only am I a cat and I'm, I'm suffering in this misery, but I have three legs. Come on, man. Like, I think our pets think that. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. But they are waiting with eager longing for us to be redeemed. Why? Because then they'll be restored. The creation will be restored. God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth where everything is right. And everything is perfect. And Jesus has made that, I mean, it's, it's as good as done. I know we look around and we feel the effects and we suffer still, but it's going to happen. He will return and make all things new. Because he was able to come and set aside his own glory. Because he became a human. Because he obeyed perfectly. And he longed to glorify his Father. And now he's the risen Savior and the Redeemer who's majestic, his name is majestic in all the earth. 
So I just want to, I want to close the last word on this. I'll let it come from the scriptures from Philippians 2, 9 through 11. It says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray.